Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Welcome to our Community Ed Series. This is about our fifth or sixth one this calendar or this school year. We've got a couple more on the docket. And I just want to start off by saying thank you to John and Wayne Allen Morris who fund these. So we're able to bring in expert speakers regionally and nationally to come speak to our parent body, our triangle body of parents that are just um, and, and community members and educators that are interested in topics to just help students, right? That's what we're all in the business doing here. And tonight we have Dr. Patricia Quinn, which we are super excited about. And not only is she speaking this evening, but we have her speaking tomorrow to a group of professionals at a professional's breakfast in the morning, and then our own faculty over lunchtime. So we're getting three presentations out of her. We're super excited. She'll be super fresh tonight. This is the first one of the <laughs> evening. But we just want to say thank you for being here. Raise your hand if it's your first time at a community ed event. This is phenomenal. Excellent. So just so you know, if it's your first time, again, we try to put them on monthly. The calendar never works out perfectly. Right now we have three back to back to back. We have one next week as well, um, a screening of Hanks, which is an incredible um, documentary. So be on the lookout on our website. We always post our community ed events. And uh, tell friends, tell community members, tell your uh, child's teacher, whoever it may be, to come on out. So we're super excited to be here. My name is Brian Brander, and my role here is head of school of our school year program and help oversee our tutoring operations and also our summer programs. We do a lot of robust programming, direct services for kids, but we also do a lot of teacher training. You're actually sitting right now in our teacher training facility where we host about 40 workshops throughout the year, and we actually spread our services throughout North Carolina, and um, we have a reading intervention uh, for struggling learners, and that map on the back uh, door there, you'll see a map of North Carolina, uh, really where we, our footprint is across the state. So we do a lot of work locally and beyond. We're super excited. The community ed events is something we try to really get behind the past couple years and find some funding and bring in some big names because we know that part of giving back is to educate a bigger population. Not just parents that are attending our school or teachers that we're training, but also the local community because often we are all asking the same questions, yet we find that we're pretty isolated and feel alone in our questions. And look around, we are not. This event is also streaming online, something we're trying to do to provide greater access to our events. So if you travel quite a distance to get here, be on the lookout for that too. We're trying to stream a lot of our events as well to make them accessible far and wide. So if you have friends or community members across the state line, so please let them know about these events. Tonight, as I said, we're super excited for Dr. Quinn's presence. Uh, if you haven't read her bio and resume, it's quite extensive. I'm gonna give you just a brief snippet and then just turn it over to her. Dr. Quinn, a developmental pediatrician in Washington, D.C., has worked for more than 40 years in the areas of ADHD and learning disabilities. She is a well-known international speaker and conducts workshops nationwide on this topic. She has appeared on Lifetime TV's New Attitudes, the PBS show, to the contrary, and on Good Morning America to discuss issues of girls and women with ADHD. In 2000, Dr. Quinn received the Chad Hall Fame Award on her work in these areas. She is the author of more than 20 books on ADHD for children, adults, and professionals, including the award-winning Attention Girls, a guide to learn about all your ADHD for girls 8 to 13, and 100 questions and answers about ADHD in women and girls. For over two decades, Dr. Quinn has devoted her attention to the issues confronting girls and women with ADHD and feels a strong commitment to helping them identify and manage these issues specific to their gender. We're in for a real treat this evening. She's gonna present for roughly an hour or so. There'll be some Q&A opportunities at the end as well. So thank you all for being here and let's give it up for Dr. Quinn. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for And um, I think we can have a little bit of a kids' education kind of a 
I'm going to be talking about both genders today, although you may hear me talk a little bit more about girls. Um, how many of you have a daughter who does have learned and have a teacher in high school? How many of you have a son? How many of you have both? How many of you have a sibling? <laughs> well, you know, I, I won't go there. Um, okay. Now we thought that this was working two minutes ago. We tried it, and we now. We are frozen. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as far as ADHD, and I'm going to call it ADHD um, because that's the really medical technical term that we use. Um, but there are three kinds three presentations. And we use ADHD as the global label for all three of them. The three presentations that we have are predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyperactive impulsive, or combined type, which means just symptoms of both. Now, when we think about this, um, we need to look at the symptoms of ADHD and how you get one of these labels. So technically, there are 18 symptoms. Nine of them are inattentive, such as daydreaming. And nine of them are hyperactive impulsive, act as if driven by a motor or something. So we take these, and if someone has six out of nine in one category, they are that predominant type. Even if they have two or three in the other category, you have to have six out of nine. So you can have symptoms in both. In the hyperactive impulsive, if you have six out of nine, you're considered hyperactive impulsive. That's the least common type. It just is purely hyperactive impulsive. If you have six out of nine in both, that means 12 symptoms, you have combined type ADHD. So that's basically how we do it. And we'll be talking about those presentations a lot this evening and using this term. That's why I started out here. There's a similarity between genders in these symptoms because you can't be diagnosed if you don't have these symptoms. However, there's a phenotypic core of ADHD symptoms that vary similar in girls to those that are described in boys, but they present differently. Let's talk about the one restless. For a boy who's restless, or another one of the symptoms is always up and on the go. For a boy with ADHD, if you go in a class, the time you really don't know where he is if he's hyperactive impulsive. He's up at the pencil sharpener, he's under his desk, he's over there, you know, and you'll find the teacher saying, where's Michael? Where's Michael? <laughs> that kind of thing. For the girl with ADHD, she doesn't leave her chair, but only about this much of her bottom is on her chair. So although they have the same symptom, it's presenting a little bit Hyperactivity in girls usually is hypertalkativeness, not hyperactivity. So what you'll find with the girls is their motor muscle, their tongue, is the one that's moving a lot, not their brain. So we say, you know, I'm going to kind of go this way. Just like talking for one minute. Chatty Cathy. 
All right, so you see these symptoms progress, and also what you see is very often they swell their hair. And they're not up out of their seat, they're not sharpening their pencil, they don't go to the bathroom all the time, but you know, you see they don't have any symptoms. There's one woman, the mother of one of my patients, and she got really anxious and they both had the symptoms. So again, these are different, although they're similar and the same symptoms, but they present different. the gender differences, we also have different prevalences. When I first started in this business, I won't even say when I first started, a long time ago. Um, most of you weren't born. Um, the ratio of boys to girls was 10 to 1. The girls we did find looked exactly like the boys. They were hyperactive, they were climbing trees, they were breaking their arms. They looked exactly like the boys. But we did find a few of them. Um, the ratios have now dropped to 0.5 to 3 to 1. Because we started changing our focus. That's for elementary school age. It gets a little lower when we get to 18-year-olds. Um, and when we get to women with ADHD, the ratios between women and men are now 1 to 5. So here's a disorder that appears in adulthood, but I'm not sure it's going to be used for us when we get to the girls. Why did we miss them? Well, first of all, boys are more hyperactive. You know, it's real. You kind of know something's going on. I remember I was at a McDonald's once, and you see this on Exodus pages. And I was at a McDonald's, and my third son said to me, there was a little boy in the McDonald's. It had a fountain with coins in it. And this little boy was taking coins out of the fountain, and he was walking along the benches, you know, with all the tables. So I said, one, two, three. He's about nine. He comes over and says to me, Mom, is that boy in your kitchen? And I said, no. He said, well, he ought to be. So again, my nine-year-old could diagnose that child in a McDonald's. With girls, we find that they're more inattentive, in inattentive to behavior. And we know from research, which we're going to be talking about tonight, that it's harder to diagnose these girls who are inattentive. So people have not been looking for this disorder in females for that reason. As I said, boys are more disruptive. They have oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorders. What's that? Well, that means uh, uh, conduct disorders you lie, cheat, steal. You don't like it. Oppositional defiant disorder is oppositional defiance will destroy the relationship. So they may talk back. They may say, I don't have to. I won't do it. Girls develop more self-esteem issues, more anxiety, and more depression. So what we see is these girls present at eight with being anxious. Someone diagnoses them as being anxious. Or they present at 12 as being depressed. Someone diagnoses them as being depressed. No one thinks to look for the ADHD in these girls, which is the cause very often, although they can have two conditions, but very often their anxiety and depression is the result of their ADHD. Girls are often diagnosed later, and they have more problems than boys. The reason why I use the term ADHD all the time, and I started out with that, is many parents come to me 
or call me or email me and say, my son or my daughter, usually their daughter, just has ADD. She doesn't have any of that hyperactive stuff. Therefore, she's not as involved. It's less serious. It's not as much of a problem. That's my take. What we see with females with inattentive types is that they have fewer symptoms. Remember, you only need six. You don't. Well, I've seen boys with all of two. Okay, men. These girls they only have six symptoms, but they're more impaired, and they have more psychiatric, psychological problems as a result of that. Particularly if it's not diagnosed. The later it's diagnosed, the more problems. Okay, so ADD and ADHD is not less severe. It's just one of the presenting types, particularly. Okay, we want to talk a little bit more about the parents. One of the things we see in research is that girls with ADHD have more somatic complaints than boys. They have more headaches and more stomach aches. They also have school refusals and school phobias. What happens with a girl is they're much more aware of how their ADHD impacts them. They may say something stupid in class. They may not have their homework. They may not have been prepared for a test. Embarrassed and humiliated. Many of them are embarrassed and humiliated by their teachers. I talk to thousands of women who will still tell you, have a chemistry teacher who said, Yeah, oh, you always have the wrong answer in that class. She's pissy because she still remembers the chemistry teacher. What we see is girls that develop. Refusal. If you don't want to go to school, I have to go first because I'm going to be doing the test. I'm not going back. Now, they don't tell you that they've been embarrassed and humiliated. The teacher may not even know that that's happened. But they refuse to have school refusal. Um, I, an example of that is I once evaluated a little girl who um, came to me. She was in eighth grade. And in class, they were talking about the planet. And um, the teacher was discussing Pluto and whether or not it was a planet. And she thought about her trip to Disney World last summer. And she had a purple bathing suit or a pink bathing suit. I don't remember which one. And the teacher asked her a question. And she said, my favorite color is pink. What do you think everybody else in eighth grade said when she said that? Did you hear what she said? What's wrong with her? And she was so humiliated that she did not go back to school after that. And the mother, thank God, brought it to me. And she not only had issues with distractibility, you know, she was going places in her head while the teacher was talking, but she also had an auditory processing that no one had gotten to. So again, we see what happens with girls. So they develop more headaches and more stomach aches. Boys have more so poorer social functioning, we know, um, as far as the night school um, interaction. But I always say the boy with ADHD can always find the other boy with ADHD to play with. They always have one friend. Girls with ADHD have more problems um, in being rejected by their peers uh, because of their behaviors uh, or because their lack of paying attention when teachers will cue, like, oh, you got a bad spot, maybe the aims are really nice, it's your birthday, I've sent you a birthday card, you know, those kind of things that you have to do to see the girls and get his attention and see what's going on and try to cue that. Uh, or they say things in class that really get them um, to be more rejected or isolated by their peers. Combined by boys were rated as more impaired than girls on social problems. They get in trouble a lot, schoolwork difficulties, and self-esteem. 
And this is early on. Later on, we see the girl problem. And in adults, inattentive type adults, male and female, you can differentiate. They both have inattentive type, but the females have more self-esteem problems too. And you can differentiate uh, in adults uh, self-esteem issues. Inattentive girls are more impaired or equally impaired to inattentive girls. So again, we see that even if you have males and females who are both inattentive, the girls are more impaired than the boys. Okay, so we also have differences by gender in how their ADHD affects staff. For example, if you have a boy with ADHD and a girl with ADHD, you both failed a test. The boy with ADHD comes home and says, that was a stupid test. What does the girl with ADHD come home and say? The same thing as far as interactions with peers. I want to play with peers. I'm looking at Alex. I'm going to this one. And the girls just say. So we see as far as how does their ADHD affect them, the girls are, uh, have ADHD affecting them, they are, and for boys, their ADHD affects others more. So they're actually bothering other people all the time, whereas for their ADHD symptoms are bothering other people, whereas for girls, their ADHD symptoms are impacting them. Okay, what prevents girls from being diagnosed? I mentioned before they're inattentive, and inattentive makes it harder to diagnose. But girls are dependent on someone else to make the referral. The teacher, their parents, somebody has to say, what is going on here? And we know a couple of things. First of all, we know that in the community, people have a model of what they think ADHD is, and it's the hyperactive elementary school age boy. And we found that even in families where they have um, two children, one's a boy and one's a girl, and they both have ADHD, and it can be a highly heritable condition. If you have one child with ADHD and a 50% chance that your other kid has ADHD. Okay, so I have had patients that I've been treating their son for seven years. They don't bring me their daughter until high school. I say, I think something's wrong. They've known about ADHD. They've been seeing me forever. And they just come seven years later and ask me about their daughter. Because the daughter doesn't look like the son. And they didn't recognize there was a problem. Or they knew there was a problem, they just didn't know what it was. We also see that teachers, 40% of teachers say that they don't know how to recognize ADHD in girls. I have spoken to many teachers on the, on the phone or uh, as I'm doing an evaluation, and I remember there was one girl that I evaluated, and I was positive she had ADHD. My educational diagnostician evaluated her. She was positive she had ADHD. And we got a form back from the teacher. You know those forms they give you to fill out? And you rate all these behaviors, not at all, just a little, pretty much area. And the teacher checked not at all, all the way down. So I, I called the teacher. She's in New Jersey. And I called her and I said, you know, what's going on? I said, I, I don't know. She said, she said, well, she doesn't have ADHD. She just needs to learn to pay attention. Another teacher said, she couldn't possibly have ADHD. She has such a nice smile. They actually did a study in Australia where they had the same case scenarios with the same symptoms, but they had a male and female name on them or Michael, and they gave them to a 1,000 teachers. 
the teachers did not refer Michelle, but they referred Michael to the evaluation. And even if they thought the girl had ADHD, they thought that she wouldn't benefit from teaching. That's a study by Ohan and Starr, BISF study. And then there's a third reason why girls aren't recognized as athletic. And that's because girls with ADHD work very hard to compensate for their ADHD, females in general. I always say about women with ADHD, they stay in the closet longer. It's a very messy closet, but they stay in there. And the same with girls. They work very, very, very hard so that no one knows they're having a problem. They work with their parents. They work with tutors. They work with anyone they can find. I once I met a woman whose mother was an alcoholic, and I said to her, how did you ever get through school? And she said, I went across the street to my neighbor, and she helped me with math. She's a brilliant child, but still. Um, the girls usually work with their mothers. They work with someone. They recopy their notes. They stay up very late at night, 1, 2 o'clock, and you know, especially when you have a kid who's also a teenager. Um, they really do work much harder to please and to compensate for their ADHD. As a result, they have a lot of anxiety, but nobody knows. And they don't get to complain too much about their ADHD. I want to just go back for a minute again to why do you think the ratios are one to one in women? Anyone have any? They refer themselves to people. They say, I have something wrong with me, I can't stand it anymore, I'm going to get help. The girls can't do that. Although I have a lot of high school girls writing me to tell me. And the last time I was at UNC, there was an 18-year-old, uh, a freshman at one of the groups I was in. I was doing a support group for the Learning Center for Students. And uh, it was a breakfast for the students. And um, she uh, was trying to convince her parents that she had ADHD. And she was given a lot of support by the group and did get, she wrote me a note and said, I'm so happy to help. Okay, what's the take-home message for, for girls? Because they work very hard and they work to try to cover everything up, good grades and satisfactory teacher reports early on cannot rule out ADHD. I had uh, a patient who was a senior in high school who came to me. Her father was a uh, neurologist. And she came to me for evaluation. I evaluated her as having ADHD. And father said, no, she doesn't have it. I said, okay. Um, so they um, said they wanted a second opinion. I gave them the name of a psychiatrist in D.C. They went to him. They walked in his office, and they said, I think she's got it. He was a real parent. Um, I don't even need to evaluate her. She was reading a book in the waiting room. She couldn't possibly have ADHD if she was focused on reading a book. Um, so again, this was a senior in high school. She had gotten a lot of support. She was very bright. What happened is she went off to college and she failed out of freshman year because she didn't have any of that scaffolding or support that she had had all through high school. What do they look like? Who are these different groups of ancestors? Um, uh, we've already talked about how symptoms may look different in girls. I think the important thing also is to understand that when they're very young, we may see um, a lot of anxiety, but as we get, they get older, we see more self-esteem and demoralization because of failure, which moves into anxiety and depression. When you compare girls with and without ADHD, they're almost seven times more likely to be depressed than girls without ADHD, twice as likely to have anxiety, 3.5 times to have antisocial behaviors compared to uh, girls without ADHD, 2.7 substance use disorders, 
and four times greater than girls without ADHD who have speech disorders. So there are significant risks. The mean age of cigarette smoking for girls with ADHD, you want to take a number? How much? 12, 13, 15, 11. Okay. Developmental issues associated with ADHD. One of the things that we find based on males and females, that the males with ADHD have a greater maturational lag. I once told a group of parents, don't count your son's development by the number of candles on the cake. And when he graduated from law school, the father called me up and reminded me of that. He was 32 when he graduated from law school. So I remember he said that, so we waited. <laughs> um, we find that greater maturational lag in frequency than in girls. They also don't have a good self-reflection. I always say, God bless boys with ADHD. We should give them a medal because every day they go to school and they show up. And they're missing 57 math assignments, but they still show up to math class. Would you do that at your work? You know, you were missing 57, you know, case, case loads or whatever, and you were doing it. And you didn't have any of that written in the script. And uh, they don't show up every day. God bless them. They have no clue. The girls with ADHD don't show up to work if they're missing that. <laughs> they wouldn't get to 57. They also have difficulty applying learning to new situations. And we see this a lot in the women. And we see it. There have been studies done in mothers who have ADHD. And they have a very difficult time with parenting because they do the same thing over and over again. And they don't learn to be flexible as far as changing things with the situation. They also gave them a while ago. They gave them CDAs, and every time it went off, they had to say where their child was. Most of the time, they didn't know where they were. Because the children had ADHD, and the mothers had ADHD, and the family had one of us. Um, the self-monitoring issues we talked about, the boys have more problems with that than the girls, but it's to the detriment. The girls themselves know that they can't do this. And again, we hear them saying, I can't do what everybody else can do. I can't do it as easily. And we end up in adulthood with a lot of the women coming to me who are very accomplished and saying they feel like they have imposter syndrome, that someone's going to come up and tap them on the shoulder and say, you really shouldn't be a surgeon. Because they know all the deficits that they had on the job. They have difficulty dealing with simultaneous events that are going on. Boys have a lot more trouble than with this than girls. And it's why in the classroom you see, when we talk about teachers uh, and what's a good teacher for someone with ADHD, um, you have to be the most important thing in the classroom for the boy with ADHD to pay attention to you. So if you're not up there doing this, and there is a tick crawling on his pencil, guess which he's going to pay attention to. And I sat through a class one day next to a boy. I was visiting his school to see how he was doing. He hadn't come to see me yet, so he didn't know who I was. And I was sitting right next to him. He just thought I was a parent. He didn't see me. <laughs> he sat there, and for the entire class period, he watched the tick crawl up and down his pencil. He would pick it, and it would crawl up. The entire class. Because to him, he couldn't pay attention to the teacher and whatever's on his desk or in his desk or in his pocket or for kids with sensory and for sensory issues, the tag in his shirt. You know, that's again why some of these kids have trouble paying attention because other stimuli are competing and they can't integrate one and pay attention um, to, an, to the one going on when two are going on simultaneously. 
know if there's a tick in the future. Sorry. They also have difficulty with transition, stopping something and starting something new. Just a minute, just a minute, you know, so, and again, wrestling with them right before bedtime. Forget it. They're not going to bed. Or if they get in bed, they're not going to sleep. And again, that's why you have to set up routines and um, for bed, good sleep hygiene, calming down, no screen time, so that you set up these um, transition periods for them and help them. That's why you say, in 10 minutes we're leaving. Not, come on, we're going. That's not going to work. And these kids know it, too. I remember once I had a boy in my office. He was squirrely. You never have a pair of squirrely kids. Never have a pair of squirrely kids. Boys, particularly, who are hyperactive types. And um, it was, he was squirreling in the chair. And I looked at him and I said, how old are you acting right now? And he said, about five. He was ten. You know, so we, we talked about the maturation of Lang. I mean, he knew what was going on. Um, but he just couldn't resist it. He just wasn't there. So again, if you want him to transfer from playing outside on the playground to inside, something has to happen in between. If you want to go home from the birthday party, some, if you don't want someone on the floor melted in a temper tantrum, you have to have something in between. You have to help them transition. You can't be in a, a rut. Okay, we get to puberty, and for boys, the hyperactivity decreases. We usually see more hyperactivity in the younger kids, the three, four, five, six. And I can guarantee they love me. I can guarantee any parent of a hyperactive three-year-old that they will not be hyperactive when they're 12. Okay. It decreases in puberty. And you know that kid in the McDonald's that was walking on, on all the tops of the page? If he was doing it at 13, they would have called the police. But it was okay at 7 or 6. So they do rein in and channel and develop other strategies for their hyperactivity that help, help them. And we actually see it decrease. For girls, the symptoms of ADHD increase at puberty. And that is why they don't get diagnosed until later. And for girls, what we see is, again, not more hyperactivity, but hyperreactivity. They're on an emotional roller coaster. That girls tell me they don't know how they are going to react in any situation. Their emotions sneak up on them and surprise them as well as you. I don't know why. You guys all like me. He doesn't like me. You know the question you never ask someone with ADHD? Why did you do that? You know what they say? I don't know. So you don't ask the question. Again, this is for the little kid. When the lamp is broken and they were in the living room, and you go in and the lamp is broken. You don't say, who broke the lamp? Okay? You know who broke the lamp. They know who broke the lamp. But if you say, you confront them and say, who broke the lamp? And they say, I don't know, I didn't do it. Then the parent calls something and say, they're lying. No, they're covering their rear end is what they're doing. They're in trouble all their lives. I had a three-year-old come to me once. And he sat in the chair swinging his legs like mad. And I said, why? The first question I was asked, why are you here? I said, why are you here? He said, because I'm bad. I said, you're three. How can you be bad? And he says to me, well, when people yell at you all the time, you must be bad. And the teachers run to the principal's office when I say those bad words. He had the teacher. He knew already that she said those bad words. He said, you run to the principal. I didn't do anything about it. <laughs> I didn't say anything about it. 
But again, these kids hear it over and over and over again. So you think you're going to say, oh, I broke your lamb. No. What you say to them is, amen, children? I want you to go up to your room and think about it for a while and come down and tell me what happened. Let them organize it. Let them think about it. Let them get themselves together. They don't feel too great that they broke this lamp. And when they come down, you, you will have calmed down, and they will have calmed down, and you'll be able to talk about it. And then there are consequences for breaking the lamp. Um, I'm going to tell you one other story because this is a great one. Um, <laughs> it was the mother of one of the boys with ADHD. These are all impulsive behaviors. And she went upstairs, and he was supposed to be brushing his teeth. And she came in, and she said, and he had taken the tube of toothpaste and had squeezed it all into the sink. So there's a sink. It isn't a tube. There's, you know, okay. So, of course, she cleaned up and everything was okay. We talked about it, and I said, now, think about this. If you had gone in and said, wow, you know, what's that all about? Well, I just, you know, I think I just broke the tube, and, you know, I wish that there would be a lamb in here. Oh, you know, I just, you know, I say, what do you want? Well, I don't know. I just want to get it all done. I want to get this all done. I want to get this done. Put more pressure at the end, you know. That's flow mechanics, okay? This kid could be an engineer, mechanical engineer, okay? He's experimenting right now. He's making a mess, but he's experimenting. So what are the consequences? Okay, clean it up, and you owe me for a new tube of toothpaste. You got money in your bank. Next time we go, you buy the toothpaste. He learned a lesson, you learned a lesson. And things were, you know, the tube of toothpaste. As a result of all these things we found over the years in these gender differences, what we found is that we need to rethink ADHD ourselves. And we need to think of it not so much as a behavior disorder. This was a bad boy in kindergarten. This was a kid who was making a mess with the toothpaste. Those are behavior disorders. But thinking of it as a learning disorder and we think of it more as a life management disorder. So how are you going to deal with it? This is the key. And we think about it more as a life management disorder. When you have the hyperactive type, we do focus a little bit more on behavior management. But we do that by positive reinforcement of good behaviors that we consider. This is how... You know, gee, I like the way you rode all the way home and you didn't hit your brother once. You know, I think you both can have a cookie when you get home. You're rewarded for good behavior. You know, catch the loose kid, you know. And we also focus on consequences of behavior. Not, you know, next week we're not going to the movies because you did that right now with the toothpaste. Well, first of all, when you made me date for the movies, the toothpaste and the movies weren't connected. Okay? So now you're changing the rules on me. You know, you, you didn't know if he squeezed this out, he couldn't go to the movies. That wasn't set down as one of the rules. I have a few rules rigidly reinforced to be consistent. to make your house run smooth, your family run smooth. And I'm a big believer in family run smooth. I don't want to ask you to do that. I don't want to ask that. But we do deal with consequences of that, and we do deal with how you can deal with that. And he made the mess with the toothpaste, you cleaned it up. Now, he may need a little supervision because playing with that toothpaste would be very enticing. we need to focus more on how they're affected by their ADHD and how we can help them 
deal with some of these issues that we're going to be talking about. In a more positive way. I want to talk a little bit now about why we use dreams also as a learning disorder. I would say every child with attentional problems has trouble learning. If you're not paying attention, you're going to have trouble learning. Not everyone with ADHD has those specific learning disabilities, however, specific learning but their attention problems do affect their learning. Reading comprehension. They're not paying attention when they do things. So they don't know what they just read. They're not paying attention when you give them instructions or the teacher gives them instructions. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They're not paying attention when the teacher is teaching ratios and they get to college and they don't know what a ratio is. They were sitting in the classroom that day but they weren't paying attention. It affects their learning. They don't all have specific learning disabilities. In order to learn, we need to pay attention. We need to have a good understanding of visual spatial relationships, which affects language and speech processing. We need to have a good working memory. We need to be able to remember and recall. Study for the spelling test. You know they knew all those words. They come home tomorrow with a 60. Why? They couldn't recall them. You also need to be able to take the sensory input from the world around you and your visual observation sound, your touch, and be able to integrate those in order to be able to learn. Visual, uh, again, would be attending to a page of um, addition and subtraction. There were all this stuff on the page. And the kid with ADHD doesn't pay any attention to the subtraction stuff. So therefore, he had to pay attention to it. Also, what you need to do is when you're staring at kids, you need a level of alertness. Most kids with ADHD have sleep issues. They don't get enough sleep. One day, research has shown that one day of sleep deprivation causes attention problems, causes sensory feedback. You know you don't get a good night's sleep. You don't function as well the next day at work. So it seems to me that, again, these kids can't fall asleep. They don't stay asleep. They wake up early. They all have different issues. But the most common is an inability to turn off and fall asleep. And kids with a lot of different levels of sleep, which is, again, going to affect their learning. Attention is also linked to movement and motivation. Uh, and I want to go back to the sensory issue again and movement. I have bad news for all of you. Kids with ADHD do learn better if the music is on in the background. even with reading, because in order to pay attention, they focus on the music and turn it off. So they turn on their inhibitory system and they can focus. <coughs> if it's very quiet, everything's going to bother them. And if they have something to turn off, they're turning on their inhibitory system. Movement also helps with alertness and attention. We used to say, we used to have a joke, I, mean, I, I was in the beginning of the ADHD culture. When I went in the business, it was minimal brain dysfunction. Well, it was minimal brain damage a few years before. It was minimal brain dysfunction, that's what we called it. And we called it hyperactivity for short. But we used to have a joke among the uh, experts back then that these little three-year-olds were running around because they were trying to stay awake that it was the movement that helped them become alert and focused. And you know with your own children, often you sit there running around playing basketball, they're very alert, they're you know, talking, and you sit them down to read, do homework, and they start yawning. 
just called cognitive fatigue. A yawn. And they go, oh, wait a minute, five seconds. And then you say, okay, get up. What are they doing? They're running around, and they're not yawning anymore. <coughs> There's one of my boys who had ADHD. He was very hyperactive. Uh, in third grade, I used to let him do a column of math problems and run around the dining room table three times. They should let him get up, run around the dining room table three times. Come back and do another row. Run around the dining room table. So I'm not saying to him, sit down and don't move. We used to have kids ride bikes and read history books. Stationary bikes. At one of our elite academies. I got them all to go down to the locker room to ride the bikes and ask them in order to read history books. So move Fidgeting, fidgets, you know why? Great book, Fidget to Focus. When I talk to parents, I can't sit with my hands and sit and sit and sit. I certainly couldn't sit with hands on that and talk to any of my kids. So when I have to sit and do a two-hour conference with parents, I have a paper, my secretary puts a pa big paper clip on each folder, and I sit there and open and close the paper clip during our entire conference. I know she does it on my hand. She sends me one new one because one is broken by the end of the conference. <laughs> so there's one on every chart on my computer. So movement is really important for kids with ADHD. You know, that's why we have these big movements around the country now. What happened to recess? Motivation is also important. Now, we wanted to make sure what Brooke Archer did we call it a motivational disorder because everyone's telling these kids if they only worked harder, they'd do so much better. They hear that all the time. You hear that quite often. But what this means is that if it's something they are passionate about or something they really like or a book that they like that that girl in the psychiatrist's office, they can pay attention. They don't have a deficit of attention. They can pay attention. Sometimes they have an excess of attention and they hyperfocus. But they can pay attention. We say ADHD is the only disorder you do something right once and we hold it against you for the rest of your life. I saw you do that yesterday. It's when I gave you the oatmeal. I think I'll give you oatmeal tomorrow morning to see if you have a good day in school tomorrow. We called them Beth. They had a good day with the eggs. They gave them eggs too. This is why some of our education is so difficult until they can choose their major, until they can choose what they want to do. And if they're passionate about something, listen, someone with ADHD can do whatever they want if they're passionate about it. Look at Branson. So again, motivation, that's why these kids play with Legos. They play with their cars. Kids say, I can't possibly have ADHD. I just saw him. He spent three hours on his iPad. Did not move off the sofa. His eyes didn't come up. He's motivated by that. Little games give him a lot of stimuli and a lot of feedback and changes every three seconds. Okay, again, very important, movement and motivation. So we need to find out, find things that motivate these kids. I'll give them a little bit more. Inattentive symptoms are significant risk factors influencing educational outcomes. Teacher ratings of inattention in grades one and two, the higher their teachers rated the kids on inattention, the poorer their academic performance grade one and two. So we know attention or inattention is a significant risk factor for academic outcomes. Okay, I'm gonna give you all a little test right now. This is fun. This is one of the tests that we use in adults, particularly, to help us decide if they have problems with attention. And this is the Stroop test. And what the directions are is that you name the colors of the following words. 
you do not read the words, you say the color of the words. For example, for the word blue, you should say red. So you say the colors as fast as you can. Yellow? Oh, you're so slow. Come on. Brown? That's red. Oh, so it's the brown. So it's easy. The words themselves have strong influence over your ability to say the color. You're all reading the words. The interference between the different information you're getting, what the words say, and the color of the words, your brain receives causes a problem. There are two theories about this. One is the problem is control. But the interference occurs because the wor you can read words faster than you can decide the color. Okay? And then selective attention theory. The interference occurs because naming colors requires more attention than reading the words. So you can see how attention and processing affect your ability to perform a task and produce it and do well on it. In the classroom, what do we see? Because of all the problems we were talking about with attention and processing and all that, see a lot of messiness and disorganization, particularly in males. In females, what we see is more messiness and grief, um, more forgetfulness. They often don't finish their assignments in class. They're off task when called upon by the teacher. You know, what are you supposed to be doing? What are you doing? Happens a lot in class. More frequent teachers will say, what are we supposed to be doing right now? What page? Poor test performance when compared to in-class work. So they can do their work when it's more structured for them, and they don't have to recall information that might be important. They frequently forget homework or assignments or turn them in late. Also, for girls particularly, those were for both more boys. For girls, we see withdrawn in class. I had had more women tell me I was trying to be the wallpaper in the back of the class. I didn't want anyone to know I was there. I didn't want any teacher to call on me at all. So the somatic complaints, the frequent absences from class, disheveled appearance, particularly in females, often loses personal items. My sister's a teacher, and she said she had the same girl who came in every day ripping all her belongings. Isn't that a wonderful word? Let me just rip my belongings. Socks coming off, socks coming off. Kind of thing. Trouble following multi-step directions, careless errors, problems with the mechanics of writing. And I want to say one thing about girls, too. Girls have a lot of organization of language problems. So when you call on them, boys do too, but boys it's more covering up, we don't call it lying, covering up when they're confronted. For girls, when they're confronted, they have difficulty organizing the language in order to explain to you what's going on. So they often say, oh, you know, it's not worth it. So what you do, again, is you give them time to organize their language. For example, in class, you give them a, a question and say, I'll be right back to you if you think about it and organize it and I'll be right back in two minutes. So again, we see a lot of difficulty with organizing language, organizing their writing. They have to do a lot of directions in class to help them understand what they're writing. Thank you. Okay, we're going to stop for a minute, and we're going to take questions on all of that. That's a lot. And I'm going to give you the floor. Yes. Great. Um, 
You mean the symptoms that you can see them at all ages and you could diagnose them? Uh, good question, very good question. Um, if they have combined type or hyperactive type, yes. If they're inattentive type, usually not. And what you need to do, what we need to add to allow them to be diagnosed earlier, because we want to diagnose everybody as early as we can, is the symptoms are there. They're not manifesting or they're being masked by all the support or a high IQ or something like that. What we want to do is to ask them, particularly the girls. When you ask an eight-year-old girl, she will tell you she's distracted by the other people. She will tell you she's not paying attention. Um, I once had a 16-year-old in my office and she said, you know, I said, well, how long have you been? I've always had trouble paying attention. No one just ever asked me. So again, a lot like that little three-year-old boy when I asked him what was wrong. They may say it in their own words, just as you did. Um, but we can make we can make the diagnosis in most children by three or four if they have combined type. Before that, all the behaviors are appropriate for two-year-olds. So you can't diagnose usually before the third. The inattentive type, if the girls are withdrawn, if they're daydreamy, if they hyper-focus on things where you can say things to them. I mean, my mother knew at three, because when I was playing with something in the sandbox, she used to say, oh, this is a long time ago, so we had atom bombs then. But she said, you know, an atom bomb could go off and you wouldn't know what had happened. I hyper-focused on things when I was three and four. Um, so she knew a very early that there was something wrong. No one knew about ADHD in women until I was in my 20s, early 30s. But, um, and then I was in my 40s. But the, um, the diagnosis can be made. Uh, a lot of times those really anxious eight-year-old girls, you talk to them, you start looking at some of the things going on. Moms tend to know much earlier than teachers because mom can see you know, moms say things like, she'd forget everything if I didn't tell her. Or she's always losing things. So at eight, seven and eight, they might see that in their daughter. And so the diagnosis can be made in some of the girls at that age. Usually we see the diagnosis made in girls at 12. Because their symptoms start, they've always had some symptoms, but they start affecting their functioning more. But if we looked earlier, we probably could identify it. Probably not at three unless they're shy and withdrawn. Or they're bossy, or they have temper tantrums, <laughs> or they're the chatty Cathy. You know, we might have a little bit more um, way to diagnose them earlier for other things. Um, my book, actually, Attention Girls, actually has profiles of all these girls in the book. And so we talk about what they look like at different ages. The book's for girls. But it's amazing. I've gotten so many letters from mothers who say, my daughter sleeps with your book under a pillow. These are the only friends she's ever had, you know, the girls in my book. Um, they're all named after my granddaughters, by the way, the two girls in the book. They don't fit their personality, but the names of the books are named after them. And from that won two awards, actually, because they were all named after me in the book. Yes. Well, you want to find someone who knows about ADHD. You need your demoralization, which is depression, secondary to having your Nothing ever goes right for me. You know, I'm always, you know, messing up or whatever. Or I'm not like other people. I'm not as smart as all my girlfriends. You know, again, for girls, it's how hard you have to work. You know, if you get an A and I get an A, but I had to study for three hours and you didn't study, you're smarter than me. So, <coughs> excuse me, there's a lot of that that needs to be done. But you want to make sure you have, you have a therapist who knows about um, ADHD in girls. Interview them. Channel <laughs> um, And again, it's very, very important because I didn't want to get into, the, I'm going to talk to the professionals tomorrow about this. But I did talk about the eating disorder. There's a lot of self-injurious behavior in these girls as they get to be teenagers. A lot of cutting, uh, a lot of suicide, self-injury and suicide in these girls because they don't get the help they need earlier on.
very important to deal with these issues. And I'm glad you're thinking about that. Yes. So um, I want to tell everybody that I recommend your book, Ready for Takeoff, with Teresa Maitland. Yes. But who has a high school kid yeah. who starts at four, like in ninth or, eight, I mean, ninth or tenth grade, because that's a great Summer before look. they go to high school. Summer before they because that's a great uh, book. It's got a great worksheet in it. It's wonderful. I also wanted to remind you of a comment you made in a Burnett theory seminar where you said sometimes girls start being diagnosed when they get their driver's license, I think oh. you told us, because they're having accidents and that's like sometimes the first you know, clue. They bump into the car in front of them, right. they you know, right. hit, the, hit the, what do you call it, the, what, the hydrant going right. around right. the corner, they back into another car, uh, stop sign, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. You're not paying attention enough. But I have... Um, three boys, all with warning differences, ADHD, and then I have a girl who's 13, just turned 13, ADHD, dyslexia, all those. Her concern is she compares herself to her brothers, and you know, you just said it manifests itself very differently. Yeah. How would you summarize? I had a total meltdown last night. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. I'm stupid. My brothers all, you know, they could get high on her, so they could get those types of things because of Hilton or because of all these things. How would you, in one sentence, boil, or two sentences, boil down the differences between girls and boys and be able to say? Well, that's the self-esteem issue, but you know how you answer course. that? How? Okay, when they have their testing, you make sure that the therapist talks to them about the results of their testing. And not just their weaknesses, but their strengths, one. Two, their IQ. That's what I don't know. Okay, but you can say to me, this is hard, you can say to me, you don't like it. You can say to me, you're angry. But you can't say to me, you're stupid. Okay? We're going <coughs> to we're gonna deal with these other issues. But the issue is not that you're stupid. And you need to deal with all these other issues. You know, therapy is not a treatment for ADHD. Going to see a therapist is not a treatment for ADHD. It's a treatment for all the other problems that come because you have ADHD. And that's something that needs to be dealt with for self-esteem. Because it's classic in the girls. You know, sometimes the boys feel guilty that they did this or that or whatever, whatever. But they are not ashamed. And they don't feel stupid. And there's no, boys will be boys for girls with ADHD. There's still expected culturally, sociocultural pressure. They're still expected to do all the things that girls and mothers have to do. And they're comparing themselves. It's also why mothers, particularly mothers without ADHD, are hard on their daughters and why the daughters are hard on their mothers, and I didn't go into that because I wasn't going to talk about this, but girls with ADHD and their mothers have what we call the toxic mother-daughter dyad. In my book, Understanding Girls with ADHD, Kathleen and uh, Dale and I coined that term because the girls are oppositional to their mothers only. They stay over Susie's house and Susie's mother brings her home and she goes, Wonderful. She can, she's lovely. She can stay over my house anytime. We so enjoy having her. And you go, oh, okay. <laughs> because she's only oppositional to and fathers. I love fathers. Thank you for being here. They come in my office and they say, I don't know if my daughter has a problem. But if she does, I'll tell you what she is. It's her mother. <laughs> you see the two of them together. <laughs> And that's what he's describing. We explain that to the fathers when they come into the office. You know, they're not doing it to you. They're doing it to her. And they do a nice little number on each other. Now we need a third party to become involved for a little while to help out with that. But that's another thing we need. That doesn't happen with boys. You know, mothers will visit their sons in prison or medical school. It doesn't matter. <laughs> You know, he, you love him, he loves you, he says, oh, mom, and you melt. You 
know, he'd come home and do this little number, and then he tells you about the car that he wrecked, you know? You okay, Ma? You need anything? Oh, you look so pretty in the dress. Oh, and the car has a dent in the <laughs> That's not between you. That's not what happens between you and your daughter. No, she's a, you got a hair growing out of your chin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to wear that tonight?
and make sure uh, that everything is, you know, in your family decided upon. Because there have been many studies now showing condom use is less in partners of girls with ADHD who are impulsive. Eating disorders are greater in girls who are impulsive. So the girls who retain their impulsivity are at greater risk for sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, um, self, um, self mutilation, and eating disorders. So you want to get those girls taken care of and on medication and know what, how to make problem solving, decision making with therapists. If they're with a therapist and everything's going really well and they go off to college, make sure they have a therapist wherever they're going. Those kinds of things. Prevent knowing. You know, I would hate to be the bearer of bad news, but knowing about it is much more important than putting your head in the sand and not doing anything about it. <coughs> when your daughter needs to know this, she needs this information. You know? I once had a patient who wouldn't come to my office. She was a teenager and wouldn't come to my office to get her prescription. I said, I cannot write you another prescription unless you come in. And she wouldn't come in. And she also stopped her birth control pill. She married a Marine and had her baby. And then she divorced the Marine. And then she went back to school. And her mother took care of the baby. She wouldn't come get her medication. I can't make her. She's over 18. But, you know, you work with them and you tell them and you bring them along ahead of time. And you work on these issues. It's really the reason why it's better to know about it and be prepared. Both you and your daughter or son. Someone had a hand. Yes. Anyone seven and above should be part of their 504 meeting. They're the one with ADHD. They're the one who has to sit in the classroom. They're the one who has to self-advocate and say, my 504 says you're supposed to do this. At seven, they should start doing that. Two more questions, both of you, and then I want to get on to your dessert. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to piggyback on what you were saying. So I have a child who will internalize that as another bad thing about themselves. So everything is internalized as I'm uh -huh. bad. Okay. So I, that's why I hesitate to tell them. You use the word she uses. Okay? Uh huh. Like when you're having these problems at home. You know, we're having these problems. You know we're having them. I know we're having them. I don't like it. You don't like it. Let's, what are we going to do about it? Okay? Anyone, a three-year-old can tell me why they're there. They use their own vocabulary of why they're there. They know. She knows. She may not like it, but she knows where she's having problems. Okay? So what this 504 is for is to help find her strengths and how we can use her strengths in the classroom and how she can do things. You know, if, if, a, if an eighth grader can stand up in front of all of you tonight, we can bring your eighth graders in. And if they can stand up here and say, or 13 year old, whatever, I have ADHD, but I'm an okay person. It's not who I am, I just have it. And if they can say, here's what I do well, here's what I have trouble with, and here's what you can do to help me, they're going to be fine. Okay? So she needs to understand that we're going to tell the teachers, she and you and the therapist or the educator who tested her or the tutor are going to come in and work with the school to tell people how she learns best and how she can perform and show everyone how smart she is. She's going to be able to tell those people that. So if, you see how it's all turned around? What about manipulation? So uh -oh. like we've talked about, she's sensitive. So now it's, oh, daddy, don't do that. You know I'm sensitive. So I can just scare her with the ADD. Um, well, well, you know I have ADD. I can't remember. Okay. So well, here's another one of my little tidbits. This is my first slide for tomorrow lunch with the teachers here. 
Here's why. ADHD is an explanation, not an excuse. Okay? That's what your daughter needs on the black pinup board in the room. Pinup board in the room. To make it all pink and fancy and glittery. It explains what's going on, but you still have to learn. You still have to do your homework. You still have to do this. You still have to do that. Yes, sir. You're last. <laughs> get into that now, but ADHD is a real disorder. It's a neurobiologic condition. It's the result of dopamine, monoamines, dopamine, norepinephrine in your brain, and what's going on in the space between, and what the medication can do, and whatever. I can't change the biochemicals in your brain in any way except with medication. I can't. So, I can change these with medication to make things easier. To reduce all these symptoms we've been talking about. Medication will reduce the symptoms. Not everyone needs it all the time. Not everyone needs it in certain circumstances. But if you want to reduce these symptoms and get rid of them, you still have to deal with everything else. It doesn't teach skills. It doesn't teach some of these other things, but it will reduce and help you pay attention, be less distractible, be less impulsive, to stop and think before you do something. So it does. But it depends on what you're doing. You know, I'm not saying you need medication and you have to take it for the rest of your life, but there may be situations where you'll be taking it. I sign a contract with all my patients who drive, which you person this up, I, sign, I personally sign a contract with them that they can, if they're distractible and have trouble with attention, they may not drive off medication. I don't want them driving on the streets with me, and I don't want them to get hurt. So um, there are things that I do put my foot down <laughs> for when it comes to their life, and particularly the impulsive ones when we're talking about making some of these I think it was John DeWitty that said medication is a great tool in a toolkit. But Absolutely. you have to make sure that you use... If you don't have 12 toolkit. things to do when you leave my office, in addition to medication, I haven't done my job. Okay? All right. Six common student styles that cause problems and affect learning. This is all about homework. This is my friend, Ian Dolan, and I, uh, we worked on those. Who lives in your house? The disorganized person? The rusher? The easily frustrated, the avoider, the procrastinator, the inattentive. All of them. Okay. I want to talk just for one minute to show you how these are different by different by gender. The procrastinator. Two nine-year-olds have to do a project for school tomorrow. Due tomorrow. The teacher told them two months ago. <laughs> they lost the paper that told about it. And anyway, never mind. So the girl and the boy both have problems with procrastination, distractibility, inattention, etc. It's the night before the project's due. A little boy who's nine says, oh, that project's due tomorrow. Well, I think I'll go watch Homer Simpson. <laughs> oh, well. The, boy, the girl with ADHD says, oh, that project's due tomorrow. Mom, mom, you know that project that I have to do soon tomorrow, and it's all your fault. I don't have anything to do it with. <laughs> you gotta help me. So the mother goes out to Walmart and buys the poster board and everything else that she needs. She comes home. She starts working on it with it's your project. You're gonna do it with me. You know, done it up. Okay. <laughs> After about 15 minutes of that, she sends her daughter to bed. And she finishes the project. Let's say it was the solar system and there were a bunch of styrofoam balls they had paint the same color as the planets that assembled and schooled them. 
Next day, they show up in science class, and Billy doesn't have his balls. <laughs> Susie has expertly painted styrofoam balls. Does the, who does the teacher think has ADHD? Did the girl also have all the same problems he had? Yes. Does anybody know? No. Okay. Quickly, these are tips that is organized child. Take time out to organize a work area for them in the house. Not a lot of stuff. Oh, I had one mother, it was wonderful. She called me up one day, I just found a cure for ADHD. I said, oh, what is it? She said, post-it notes. Okay. Create a work folder. Post a checklist. My daughter-in-law said to me about two weeks ago about my 10-year-old granddaughter was just diagnosed. Um, well, what do I do? I said, you and she work on a list of what she needs to do and you put it in her work area or you put what she needs to bring the next day beside the front door. Then all you need to say is, look at your list. And she has a way to control of this herself, not you nagging her. Okay? Post a checklist of what she has to do or they have to do while they're there. And give them a bonus, whatever it is, more screen time probably, for staying organized or keeping it neat or working only in that area, whatever. Okay. The rusher. Get it done, it's done. All right, I had a father who did this with his child and he called me up and he said, this is better than sliced bread. They decided how long homework would take, how long they needed to do it. The teacher could help consult her. This should take them a half an hour. The child had to work for half an hour. He got it done faster. It didn't matter. Here's a whole menu of what you can do if you finish. That same granddaughter I was just talking about has a Star Wars something or other in the class, and if she finishes her work, she can do the Star Wars workbook. She doesn't bother anybody else. And she's tended to really slow down here with the rushes as well. Easily frustrated. Then with an easy assignment. Break things down. Very important. Remember that son that I told you about? You know, this is, this is my son who would sit there with his worksheet, math worksheet, 60 problems, and he'd go, I can't do this. I'm stupid. I can't do this. It's too hard. Okay, I would get out of scissors and I would cut them into rows. And I would give him one row to finish. And I would do something. And then I'd give him another row to finish. And here another row, and he's he's going to say, "Wow!" And another day, this was a long time ago. Um, he had to, as an assignment, underline the verbs with two lines and the nouns with one line. And he was taking forever. I said, "Wait a minute!" And I went down and went to our dear copy machine, and I copied the page off for him. And I said, "Because he had to copy each sentence and then do that into his book." And he had dyspraxia as well as everything else, like a lot of your kids probably do. And so I just there, I said, and he was done like in three seconds, and he goes, that was easy. You know, because he didn't have to copy the whole sentence and underline the noun and verb. All he had to do was underline the noun and verb. So those kinds of things can make homework easier, <coughs> and you can work out those kind of things. Take a break. This poor son, I use him all the time. I thought I had him. That's what I told him. Um, <laughs> Most of the time. Oh, another trick for you. You have to get a picture. The cutest picture of your child you've ever seen. Frame it and put it in your bedroom. When you really need to put down the gun, go look at this picture. You say, oh, they're so cute. You know, it's when they're sleeping after they've just had that horrible fight after they got out of the bath. You know, and when they're finally asleep, you go in the room and you say, oh. You know, you're going to need that picture a lot. 
Take a break. Okay. Now, I tell parents not to work with their children for homework. Absolutely. It was their homework to set up. up. And you know, you know, it's not your job. Okay, so one night I was helping my son do his homework. <laughs> and I realized what I was doing. Oh, wait a minute. This is your homework. Oh, I know what it was. I had a he had asked me what a word was, and I said, you need to look it up in the dictionary. So then I went, so he said, you need to look up about it. And I said, oh, I forgot. This is your homework. No. I said, I'm going to go do what muffins do. I'm going to go get you some chocolate chip cookies. So I went out in the kitchen and got the chips ahoy out. And I made a lot of noise, and I made he liked tea, and I made him a cup of tea. And I got all the chocolate chip cookies on a plate, and I put it on a tray. And I brought him into the place where he was doing his homework. What do you think he was doing? Looking up the word in the dictionary. <laughs> OK, and we had our tea, and everything was fun. But again, they may need breaks. I mean, he had been pushed too far, and he was not going to look up that word in the dictionary. Uh, and then again, for the easily frustrated, a checklist or a graph or something so they can see how they're progressing with their work. You know, check off. Oh, I got this done, I got this done, I got this done. You know, today I did this much, yesterday I did that much. They need the visuals of seeing that they are accomplishing something, that they are getting things done, so they're not as frustrated. Okay, the avoider. Well, this is the hardest one. Any of you have avoiders? This is the most difficult. You need to give them some control back. They can choose what they want to do, when they want to do it, blah, blah. But the bottom line is, it needs to get done. And for the avoider, if you do that, it will usually work out. But sometimes you need to give it to them in small pieces to begin. You know, you're training them a little bit. There's a little bit of freedom. There's a little bit more. There's a little bit more. There's a little bit more. Uh, and that can help. You need to really work on breaking the cycle of ne negativity. These are usually the children who are most sensitive to failure. They have failed, failed so many times. If I don't do it, I won't fail. You know why they're avoiding it? Because if I don't do it, I can just say, I didn't fail that. I didn't do it. It saves space for themselves. Notice small improvements. These are the kids who really need that. They're so frustrated by all this negativity and all that's gone on, they need help with all this. And this is a really, really important one. Use rewards and say yes more often. You can say after this is done. Don't say no, you can't do it till your homework's done. You said no, that's all they hear is no. So if they've asked to do go over their friend's house or do this or that, <coughs> yes, you can do it after your homework's done. Not no, you have to do your homework first. That's all they hear is the no, and they explode. There's an eruption. Use anything but the word no. Let me think about it. Let's talk about it again tomorrow. Maybe. My husband always says, we'll see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. What does that mean? No. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I tell him. He didn't say no, though. <clears throat> this is really a key for the kids who have been so frustrated they're now avoiders. Really very important. I, when I used to do parent training, I used to have the parents take a golf counter, and a stroke counter, that's all, and their first assignment was to go home and click it every time they said something nice to their kid all week. The next week, they'd all come flinking into my office, <laughs> and they'd say, oh, we did it five times. You know, again, we forget. You love it when your husband says, Let's go out to dinner, even though the ironing's not done, honey. I'll still take you out to dinner. 
Even though your homework's not done, let's go out for pizza. Don't you love it? Let's go get some ice cream. We both need it right now. Okay, the procrastinator. Establish your routine, play beat the clock. Let's see how many problems you can get done before five o'clock, and if you do, we'll go get ice cream. Okay, try the tolerable 10. That's just do it for 10 minutes. Anybody can do anything for 10 minutes. Now you're gonna have to do another 10 minutes after that. But, you know, I'll tell you that, yeah. So again, beat the clock, tolerable 10. Let's just do it for 10 minutes. Let's just do 10 problems. Try a different approach to prioritizing. Do easy to hard, harder to easy, or whatever, easy hard, easy hard, whatever works for them. You discuss this with them. Let them have a little bit of control. Which one do you want to do first? Which one do you want to do second? Let's make a list. And work on these to help them get this done. Most people use the pressure with ADHD, use the pressure of being under the gun, that adrenaline, that fear, to motivate them. We're trying to teach them how to do this in a different way. So you're not using that pressure of being under the gun to get things done. We get it to edit. Again, a special study space. This is very important. The reason why special is, uh, has the quotes around it is, um, if you're particularly inattentive and distractible, I can get you a single dorm room by writing your college a letter and saying that your child, you know, can't be in a room with three other guys. I did that for one of my patients, and I got him a private dorm room. He calls me up as soon as he gets there. Now, this is not easy to do, but I can do it. He got there, and he calls me up, and he says, Dr. Quinn, this is not going to work. I go, oh, Timmy, why? He goes, well, they're building another building outside my window. There's a big hole with all this equipment out there. I am going to be sitting here every day watching them build the building. You need to get me out of this room. Yeah, that's again, someone who knows what's going on, someone who works on it, someone who knows what's distractible. My son, that precious boy that I was talking about, the teacher put his desk next to her desk. Bad move. Every time every child in the class was finished an assignment, they walked up and put it on the teacher's desk. Everybody in the class, 20 times a day, walked in front of my son's desk. He said, Mom, I can't do it. You know, they all touch my desk, or I look up, or I talk to them, or they talk to me, blah, blah, blah. But that was first grade. He knew that he couldn't have all the kids walk by his desk all those times to put stuff on the teacher's desk. Plus, he loved to look what was on her desk. She had all those neat little things. Anyway, so you need to ask this child where they think they will study best. It may not be the kitchen table. It may be, I've had kids that like to stand in the corner. Not stand, sit. You'll face their desk to the corner and look at the corner. They self-select, that's fine. Make a mountain out of a molehill, again. This is really good. You've been paying attention for 10 minutes. Great. Support self-monitoring. That means, are you on task? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing right now? Help them know what they are. Create a queuing system, let them know if they're not on task. Let them fidget, remember we talked about that, and use mystery motivators. You know, a bag with stuff in it. If you work for 10 minutes, you can put your hand in this bag and whatever the thing says you can do. Next. And then go back to your homework. Okay. Any questions about any of those or any other questions that were finished? Anyone who needs to leave? We've run a little over. Yes. Okay, do you want 
want them to notice what the other kids are doing? Do you want them to make their bed? Do you want them to pay attention when the, they say, we're now going canoeing, open on your bathing suit, and everybody else has got their bathing suit on, and they can't go in the water yet because your daughter doesn't have her bathing suit on, and now the whole cabin hates her because she wasn't paying attention. ADHD affects your life. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And all those things have to do with attention. So, now, one more question. For the parent who also happens to have ADHD, that was never diagnosed, but you're answering your question in your head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. write to me, email me, I'll send you a free pamphlet that I have. When moms and kids have ADD, I'll send it to you free. And uh, you can be a wonderful role model for your child in dealing with their ADHD as you deal with it. Thank you all for coming. It's been great meeting you. You were really smiley, great group for so late at night. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, I'm sure you know them well.